Hey, Tanya, that was a pretty awesome interview that we just did with Luz Catigna. And yeah, what, what were your thoughts? He's been doing it for 40 years. On the investment side, he has a lot of experience and he's very passionate about certain topics that we hear. It's a lot, a lot of things are common sense. You know what I mean? Like buying a car you can't afford over buying on a house. But to hear his perspective on it and how it's going to affect inflation, I think gave a really good, take a real hard look at how we're spending our money and make better choices today so that we can like not have to stress so much. 100%. Made, made me rethink a lot of things. And I even told him like jokingly how I was triggered by uh, one of the things he said because of the buying the brand new car. I'm kind of in both spectrums. Like I bought the new car, you know, that I have here and then I have my other car that's been paid off for, you know, the last four years. So yeah, I've, I've been on both sides of that and I'm feeling both sides of that right now, but um, I, I understand where he's coming from, right? With, with the average American that is putting them, kind of locking themselves into such high debt and not giving themselves really a way out. And with the way inflation's been and the potential for the hyperinflation that might be coming, he gave some really great points on how to protect yourself from that with hard assets. So I definitely yeah. appreciate that. And if, on top of that, for those that are going to tune into this episode today, there's some free resources that you can get at the end of the episode. So make sure you stay tuned to the end. Yeah. Don't definitely skip to the end. <laughs> Listen to it all. Because he talks a lot about di diversification and his strategy on investing, which I think a lot of people should hear and listen yeah. to because people get confused by what to do and where to put their money. So I think he gives a lot of good advice on that as well. And just is like super passionate and very fired up about helping people. And I think obviously that's what we love to do as well. <laughs> 100%, 100%. Hey, uh, really hope you guys enjoy this episode. Tanya asked some great questions, by the way, better questions than me because she's crushing it. But this is one of the things I love when I do interviews with her because we get to have this dialogue and talk about the episode afterwards. And it, it just gives like a whole different feel to it, right? Because I get to sit here and, and like kind of digest what we just went through, right? So like during the interview, you're sitting there eating and eating and eating, taking a sip of the wine or whatever. And now afterwards, it's okay. It's digesting. It's settling. And huh, yeah, there was some good stuff, some good nuggets that we got out of that. Yeah, it's awesome. You guys are going to love this episode. Yeah, tune in. Hi, this is Garrett Sutton, and you're listening to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash the like and subscribe buttons. If you're listening to our podcast, go leave us a five-star review. All of our links can be found in the video description or show notes below. Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni. And I'm your co-host, Tanya Schultz. And today's guest is Lou Skatigna. And actually, I normally ask how to pronounce a name before we start the episode. I did not ask you, Lou. How did I do? Perfectly. Oh, better than 99% of the people who try to pronounce my name. Well, it must be because I'm also Italian. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the last name of Cavagioni. A lot of times people uh, mess well, it up. So. Well, if you're Italian, you should know it's really Scatina. Right. Just like, like lasagna. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There you go. Oh, yeah. 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 But I've American, I, I Americanized my name. <laughs> same, same thing. Yeah. Same thing with my name. It's Americanized. So, okay. Perfect. Hey, Lou, so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's great to be with you. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Awesome. Tanya and I will uh, kick this off the same way we start every podcast episode, and we'd like to know more about you. So could you share a little bit about yourself and tell us your story and just tell us who is Lou Scatigna? All right. I've been a registered investment advisor or a broker for 40, it's going to be 41 years in October. Uh, I've been a certified financial planner and tax accountant for 37 years. I'm a personal finance author. The book is The Financial Physician, How to Cure Your Money Problems and Boost Your Financial Health. And I've been a radio talk show host for 25 years and podcaster. The name of my show is The Financial Physician. And what I did years ago as a financial planner meeting with people, I like to use the analogies of health with money. 
And there's so many times we could do that. And that's when the financial physician was born. And uh, we've been very successful with it because people understand medical issues more than they understand financial issues. And I'll try to use medical analogies with finance, whatever I can. I love that so much. I do that in my coaching too. It's like your health related habits are so related to your financial habits, right? I always say most people don't like to work out. They like the result that working out's given them. Just like a budget, like you have the budget, the budget's the tool to get you to your goal. So how do you use that physician format to help get, encourage people or educate people? Well, let's use an example of overspending, getting into debt. That's the same as smoking and drinking and doing drugs in your physical life, right? So there's habits that are bad. There's habits that are good, both for physical health and for financial health. And I try to use those analogies. Credit card debt is cancer to the financial body. That's one of them I like to use a lot because credit card debt obviously is the worst that anybody can have. And it's terrible for your financial health. So that's the analogies, kind of simple analogies I like to use. I love that. I love how you're using it like pretty directly. Like you're not like sugarcoating it. You're like, nope, this is cancer, da, da, da. Like being very clear. Because I think pe- some people try to sugarcoat it a little bit more. So I love that directness. Yeah, I was, well, I was going well, to like, jump in on that too and say that because I love talking analogies as well. Like I'm always comparing different things. It makes it more digestible, right? For people that are listening, when you have something you can do- directly compare it to, right? So Tanya was saying though, like comparing credit card debt to like cancer I think is a great analogy because it just shows the severity, right? Of leaving it unchecked, right? If you catch cancer early, you can treat it and you can take care of it, right? But if you wait and something's not feeling right and you're not going to the doctor and all of a sudden when you finally go to take care of the problem, it's too late and it's spread everywhere. Yeah. When your debt's exploding, it's metastasizing in your financial body, you're done. And I, I counsel people all the time that come to me that are just, they're beyond the point of no return. They're looking at bankruptcy, which is radical surgery at that point, right? I think that's a good analogy. And I think it hits people because they think of it differently than just thinking about I'm building up debt. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Okay. Exploring what you've done, right? With just your career, right? So 41 years as a broker, 37 years as an accountant, right? What are some of the things that uh, I guess you could say that you've seen where people have gotten themselves into that situation where they've reached that point of no return? What were some of the things that you saw that led up to that, that you maybe warned them about and said, hey, you're on the wrong track? And what are some of those things that you identified to try to get them out of that spot before they actually hit it? Or did they already come to you already in that position? To be honest with you, most people who come to me have money and, uh, you know, you don't go to a certified financial planner if you're on the balls of your feet and you're ready for bankruptcy court. You don't usually go into that. I deal with people who have done the right thing, but many times people come to me pre-retirement and they've done all the wrong things. And I'll tell you later on in the program, changes that I've seen in the 37 years I've been a certified financial planner. A lot of it's psychological, but it comes down to probably two things, especially financial illiteracy, where people don't understand money and don't really want to learn about it because it's not a subject that most people want to deal with. It's Uh, not the sexiest thing to talk about. No, of course not. And financial responsibility, all right? Being responsible, just like in any other aspect of your life. If you become irresponsible financially, you're not going to succeed financially. But let's keep it simple. There's two reasons why the average family has no net worth when they hit retirement. Two things, cars and houses. The decisions we make with those two things, how we buy them and how we finance them. I have a whole, I have a chapter in my book about the proper way to buy and finance cars. I have a chapter in my book on the proper way to buy houses. And the more more damaging thing, it's not really houses because the debt that you incur on houses is usually good debt, right? Mm -hmm. And houses appreciate. When it comes to autos, you buy a new car every four years or so, you are buying a depreciating asset. It's the opposite of an investment. Yeah. It's, you spend 40000 50, and now cars are like buying houses were 20 years ago. I know, it's crazy. The price of the houses, right? As soon as you, you, you roll out of that dealership, you just lost 18% of your money. Yeah. So I did a calculation in the book that if you buy over the course of your 
car buying life, if you just look at the first year depreciation, the money that you lost and you invested it at a, a, a reasonable rate of return, you would have a retirement plan over half a million dollars just on the money that was lost and the opportunity to cost of the money lost through depreciation. All wow. right. So I say, unless you're extremely wealthy, you should never, ever, ever buy a new car. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we talk about strategies buying two year old cars coming off a lease. Mm -hmm. There's dealerships that deal with that. And even I don't buy new cars. Mm -hmm. And I could afford a new car every year for cash if I wanted to. But I, I still, in my own psychology, my own mind, right and wrong, I don't want to buy a new car because of the depreciation. I'd rather buy a two year old car. Somebody else ate the depreciation. A two year car, a two year old car with 25,000 miles is a new car. Mm hmm. A yes. lot of times, a lot of these times, these cars smell new. They they look yeah. new. You you wouldn't even know yeah. that it wasn't new. Uh, so uh, but some people have this thing where they need to have a new car, brand new car with all the new technology every four years or so, and that's debilitating financially. That's terrible. And then the other thing is people buying too much house. I mean, when I grew up, I'm the oldest of six kids. I don't come from money. We struggled. We had a Cape Cod. We had one bathroom. Can you imagine that? Six kids yes. in one bathroom and two sisters. Can you imagine us all getting ready for school in the morning? And four of us were born four years in a row. Oh, my right? God. So we were, like, all together. And you so, still li and you li you lived and I, did, I didn't know <laughs> I, I didn't know there was anything wrong with it. <laughs> all right? Uh, I mean, it was fine. But now people, they have two kids, and they have four bedrooms, a McMansion, uh, big property, taxes, big up, big utility bills, high insurance costs, and a high mortgage payment. Right. Because they believe that's the way America lives now. Also, when we talk about we're talking about houses and cars in 1966, my father bought a new car. It was a Ford station wagon. I'll never forget. it. I was six years old at the time. Mm -hmm. When I turned 17, it became my car. Mm -hmm. So think about that. It's 11 years later. I had it for three years and then it became my brother's car. So nowadays you Turn in that car, you trade it in after four years, then you get a new one and start yeah. the whole cycle over and over again. It's like a perpetual car payment. Why would you want a perpetual car payment? Anybody's ever paid off their car and kept the car. A lot of people think, I paid off the car. Let me go get a new one. Yeah. No. Why not drive it till it dies on you and have five, six, seven years without a car payment where that money can go into an IRA account or more money into your 401k? But that's not the way Americans have been condition to live. So Lou, real quick on that. So I have both, right? So I'm a little triggered right now. I'm kidding, but I have both, right? So I have my car, right? I have a Tesla and I'm making payments on it. And I only did it because I got a ridiculously low APR. But then my wife's car, we have a 2013 GMC terrain that we paid off years ago. And we are just running that thing until it's dead. But the money that we're saving from that is actually going into another account to buy her next car cash. So either it's going to be a probably like a newer used car. Like you said, the two years, there's a specific car she's waiting for that just came out. So we're waiting until they're used now to try to pick one of those up because it will depreciate like crazy instead of buying it brand new. Because a lot of these cars, like you said, brand new, some of the newer cars coming out are like 60, 65, $70,000. It's ridiculous. Right. And the worst car you could buy is an EV car. Yeah. They depreciate <laughs> so rapidly yeah. because at some point you have to replace the battery, which is $14,000 or something like that. Yeah. An another well, which thing is too, why yeah. I'm going to get rid of it before I get to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You couldn't get me to buy an electric vehicle, but they're trying to force it down our throats. We may have no choice at some point, but nowadays with the price of cars going up so much, the average car payment for a new car right now is $750 a month. Mm -hmm. The average interest rate on the loan is 8%. Gone are those zero interest financing deals that used yeah. to be around. You can't find them anymore. And new cars, they've appreciated too. They appreciate cost more for a new car now than it did five years ago. And that interest rate is 12%. And yeah. the average payment is $550. So, and, and many people are paying over a thousand a month for a car. Could you imagine that? And people wonder why they can't save money for retirement. People come to me 55 years old. They say, look, I'm going to be retiring in 10 years. I'm on the wrong track here. We make good money, but we can't save any. Let's figure out where it goes. The first thing I ask them, what's your mortgage payment? What's your house worth? What's the balance on your mortgage? The second question I ask, tell me about your cars. 
do you have car payments? Both husband and wife have car payments, right? So just between your house and your car, between your mortgage and, and, and taxes and your car payment, many Americans have to make $75,000 pre-tax just to pay for that. And we're not talking about insurance. We're not talking about utilities, cell phone, food, all the other stuff that goes into life. That's why you can't save any money. And that's the thing that Americans don't do is do it right down on a piece of paper where all your money comes from and where it goes, right? It's called a budget. It's not a hard thing to do. But many, many Americans don't want to do it because they're afraid of what they're going to see. Yeah, but you use that B word, right? That's why I, I, I like to call it a spending plan when I'm working with people, right? Because mm. you use the B word and it turns people off when you say budget. So I'm like, okay, call it a spending plan. Call it whatever the hell you want to call it. Call it that, right? Cash, but, cash flow. Uh, there you go. I don't care. I still call it a budget and it's all the reframing, right? In coaching, everything's about reframing. It's like what you're taught. And for me, it was like, I had to take a look in the mirror, like Lou, what you're talking about earlier. Like something I'm doing is at work. It's like me. It's not my family. You have to take responsibility. And I think that's the biggest thing is I was never budgeting. I was never actually, I was looking at my money every month, but I wasn't like actually tracking and looking at that and taking responsibility. But once I did, it actually gave me a way more sense of control and freedom around my money instead of now knowing I have a plan to reti retire when I want to and get on that track. So yeah, it's crazy. You were discussing this for a second, like you brought this up and I know you want to talk about hyperinflation that's coming. What should people know about that? Or what's your take on what's going on with inflation? Because you're saying all these interest rates are going up. Everything else is going to continue to go up. So what can we do to get to control of that if we don't already manage? Well, well even before inflation started picking up and interest rates started rising, we still had the same problems in America where savings are very low. Yeah. Uh, people live for today. They don't think they're ever going to retirement's 40 years off, 30 years off, 20 years off. When you're 20s, you don't even care about retirement. In your 30s, now you have kids. So you're buying your first home. You're paying for your kids. In your 40s, you start to think about college and you're spending for college on your kids. And then by the 15s come around and now you say, now I want to do some retirement planning. Yeah, You're going to have to save 30% of your paycheck now between now and retirement to have enough to retire with. Meanwhile, if in your 20s, you put, say, $2,000 away for nine years and don't add another dime to it, and it grows. If you start nine years after that person did, you have to go 40 years or something and put $2,000 in to get the same amount of money. So it's a combination of saving money and time. But again, if you're 20 years old, do you really want to save for when you're 65, 75 years old? No. You want to go buy that new car. You want to have fun and get that big house and all that kind of stuff. Well, what yeah, do you think on. that people can do? Obviously, we know a lot of the issues that are going on <laughs> in society today. So what can they do, say, if they're already in their 20s? Like besides budgeting, how do people have to think differently? And what do, what actions do they have to take besides budgeting and all that? Like in order to get to not let inflation affect them so much. Yeah. How do they um, get ahead of that? simply uh, spending less than you make. It's that simple, right? I mean, look, there's, there's three different ways you can go. You could spend less than you make, which means you could save money. You could spend everything you do make, which means that you don't save money, but you're not borrowing money. Or you could spend more than you make, and which means that you'll make up the difference with debt and probably credit card debt. And I'll touch on inflation in a second, but Another problem that I'm seeing now with people coming in for retirement, they're retiring at 65 or whatever it is, is that they still have a mortgage. Many of them have car payments, student loan debt from their kids, credit cards. Earlier in my career, I've been doing this 40, 41 years now. For the first 25 years, when I sat down with people retiring, their house was paid off. Many of them had a pension in addition to social security, they didn't have credit cards. Many of them had paid off their car or had enough assets that they could buy a car for cash. And now they were ready to retire. Nowadays, people entering into retirement haven't saved a lot. They have a mortgage still because they refinanced their house every time it went up to either pay off the credit card debt or pay for college or whatever it is. And now they come to me and say, Lou, how am I going to get by? And many of them, their 401k balances are very low because of all those reasons I just told you. And now they're going to live on social security and pay a mortgage and pay car payments and student loans and credit cards. We're going to have a poverty problem in this country for retired people like we've never seen before. 
And most of my clients are retired people or pre-retirement. I learned early on in my career that the older people had all the money and the younger people had all the debt. I decided to go where the money is. And I've been a senior financial advisor almost exclusively for most of my career. But you can see the demographics changing. Now, what is current people's retirement plan? If they're lucky, inheritance from their parents. That's their retirement plan, if they're lucky, all right? If you have parents, because the older people, my older clients who are now in their 80s, many of my clients have been with me for decades. My, my firm is 37 years old, I started, but many of my clients have been with me for a long time. Now they're dying off in droves, and I do a lot of end-of-life planning now. And they never spent their money. My hardest job as a financial planner was getting my retired clients to spend their money because psychologically, their whole life, they were trained to, to save, not to spend. What did you save for? Retirement, right? So that's when you're supposed to spend it. You didn't save it for your kids' retirement because they will spend, right? So, but for many people, my client's kids, my clients die. I sit down with the kids. We got an inheritance here. And they're like, thank God I had, my parents had money because I don't. And for many of them, it is their retirement plan. But many people don't have parents with a lot of money and they have a, a different future ahead of them. Now, talking about inflation, that makes everything even more worse because if the price of everything is going up and your wages and your savings isn't keeping pace, you all know what it's like to go to the grocery store now. I'm the cook in my house. In addition to being a financial planner, I love to cook. That's the Italian side of me. Uh, and, and I'm in grocery stores three times a week. And I just I go in there for a few items. I walk out with two bags and I just spent a hundred bucks. It's just amazing. I use this joke. I say, the older I get, the stronger I get. I'm 64 years old. I can carry $150 of groceries in one hand. Right. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't get difficult. two bags for a hundred dollars because that's one bag in Hawaii. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, like it's, it's crazy. I know you, you know better than anybody the, the cost of goods and services there. But is inflation, which has been low for decades, has now transitioned into what I think is going to be the major story. And it's just economics 101. I mean, any country, if you look in history, and I'm, I'm a student of economic history, I've gotten all my program on my radio show podcast, I've gone over all the major inflations in the world from the Weimar Republic, actually from Rome to the Weimar Republic, to Hungary, to Zimbabwe, to Argentina. It's the same recipe all the time. A country goes from surplus spending to deficit spending. And the only way you could have deficit spending is going deeper into debt, whether, whether you're a family, an individual or a country, right? The debt builds up, the debt builds up. And finally, it breaks. It requires higher interest rates to service those debts. And all of a sudden, inflation starts breaking out. Because now, if foreigners don't want our debt and Americans don't have the money to buy our treasury bills, who's the buyer of last resort? The central bank, right? The Federal Reserve. They monetize the debt through the creation of money. You can call it QE, you can call it oh, whatever you want. It's printing money. The more you expand the money supply, the higher prices get. Uh, and it's the same formula every time. And ultimately, it's going to end in a currency collapse and hyperinflation. Every time, it's happened 100% of the time. Now, is it going to happen tomorrow? I don't think so. Is it going to happen five years from now? Is it 10 years? I don't know. But the fact is, if you're not prepared for economic hard times in the future, and I think they're coming, I've never been more concerned about the economic future of our country in my 40 years in this business than I am now. And I think so many people are unprepared for it. They don't have emergency funds. Many people, I think, are going to lose their jobs. And I hope I'm wrong. I don't want to be the gloom and doomer. But the fact is that I've done enough research on economic history, and we're going right down the path. No country in the history of the world has uh, incurred more debt than we have. And uh, uh, what's our deficit this year? Two trillion, right? That means the Fed's going to print two trillion more. Uh, because China's not buying our debt. Russia's not buying our debt. About, as a matter of fact, they're doing the opposite. They're, they're relinquishing our debt. They're selling our debt. And unfortunately, we're going to go down the road of uh, extreme monetization, which is the beginning of the end for a country as far as hyperinflation goes. Yeah, we're already seeing the dollar become, it's not going to be the standard across the, the globe anymore, right? So there's a lot of countries now. I think Brazil was the most recent one 
now taking on the new, what they're merging, I, I guess, with China, right? So they got BRICS, that going the BRICS on. countries. The yeah, BRICS yeah. countries, yeah, yeah. So that's going to be a big threat to the West, by the way. Yeah, and they're stepping away from the dollar. A lot of countries are just starting to step away from the dollar, which is kind of scary when you think about that. You had mentioned something, Lou, that's in the back of my head now. You mentioned that a lot of people don't have like emergency funds and things like that. But I feel like uh, if we get to the point where we have hyperinflation, an emergency account isn't going to help, isn't going to do much for you, right? When that money becomes worth less and less and less as it's sitting there, right? So what what are some things people can do? I know you don't want to be the doom and gloom guy. I don't want to be him either, right? And all this apocalyptic stuff, right? But let's say it happens, right? And we hit hyperinflation and we are in, at that point now where our dollar becomes almost worthless. What are some safeguards that you would say people should consider and start considering now, right? Especially with where we're headed right now. So what would you say are some safeguards people can use to to keep themselves? It's not going to keep you 100% above water, but maybe get you close to it. Inflation hedges. Okay. What's an inflation hedge? Hard assets of some kind. Your house is a hard asset, okay? Precious metals is a hard asset, all right? Energy, commodities, food, all, all hard assets. Money in the bank burns up in inflation, all right? Meanwhile, certain things prosper in inflation. Look what we've seen happen to housing prices in the last five years, right? That's inflation. That's a de- direct response to zero interest rates for 13 years, the trillions of dollars that have been printed and the stimulus checks and all that kind of stuff, it's the recipe for inflation, right? So I myself, as a financial advisor, I would never recommend this to my clients. But personally, I have 35% of my net worth in precious metals, right? Because I see this coming. I'll be fine if this happens. I have a third of my wealth in precious metals, a third of my wealth in real estate, and a third of my wealth in dollar-denominated securities, cash, and things like that, right? So if one-third of my assets burn up, the other two are going to be skyrocketing. I'll be okay, all right? But people who have money in the bank, don't own any equity in their house, are living paycheck to paycheck, I shudder to think how they're going to get by. I really do, if the worst case plays out, okay? I pray to God it doesn't. And I always say this because I did my... The first week I do my podcast in January, I do my forecast. I kind of do it as a fun thing. I like predicting the market, what's gold going to do, oil. I even do a political forecast, a geopolitical forecast, because my show is money, markets, and politics. All right. So we talk a lot about what's happening. And, and one thing I learned early, early on is that what happens in Washington affects our finances. <laughs> There's nothing that affects our finances more. Taxes, health care, inflation, all of these things. So you got to keep a keen eye on those rascals in Washington and what they're doing because that's going to affect your financial life. Yeah. All right. So that's how you protect yourself. You look at alternative investments that may go up in an inflationary scenario. But if you're like the average American, if you're living paycheck to paycheck now, how do you acquire a bunch of precious metals? All right. I mean, gold, look at gold. Gold's at a, an all-time high right now, right? And, and going a lot higher. That's a re- direct reflection of inflation. I bought all my gold at 800 back probably 15 years ago, right? I've never sold an ounce, all right? It's 2400 right now, right? It's kept pace with inflation. And that's all I'm trying to I, do. So, Lou, I, I really, it upsets me that you bring it up that you were buying it at 800 because it's funny because I had a lot of gold that I sold at 800. And I, I was telling the story to some of my friends the other day. I was like, yeah, I was like, and yeah, it was actually about 15 years ago. I was still in the Navy and I had a whole bunch of like gold jewelry and just stuff that I, I just didn't wear, didn't use. I'm like, I'm just gonna get rid of this stuff. Right. And I sold it when it was like $800 an ounce. I had this one necklace that I got like $1,200 for. It was ridiculous. Right. And if I was to have that stuff today, I would have just held on to it. It'd be worth so much more. If you do have gold jewelry or things like that that you don't wear and you're thinking about selling it, just hold on to it. Don't absolutely don't do do what I did 15 years ago Uh, and then have somebody like remind you of it and give you PTSD. (laughs) But I tell people now, I say, look, many people can't afford to walk into a coin dealer and pay twenty four hundred dollars for American Eagle one ounce gold coin. Sure. But you can walk into a dealership and pay $35 for an American Eagle one ounce silver coin. I'm of the belief that silver is going to go up more 
in percentage terms than gold will. All right. Well, it's the used pro- so much. It's huge in the industry. It's also easier it's, to barter it's with. Full of it. Full of yeah. Solar. Oh, solar cells, all yeah. kinds of technology. So it has an industrial use, but it's way undervalued. Gold's at a record high. The record high for silver was 49. I think it closed around 30 yesterday. So it's far from its all time high. And if gold goes, look, gold, people ask me, is, is gold too expensive at 2,400? No, it's going to 5,000. It's going to 10,000. It's going to 25,000. All right. If we stay on the path that we're on, and I'm pretty sure that's the path we're going to go on because I can't see any other path. That's what's going to happen. That's why I never sold an ounce of gold. And I have a lot. I have never tried to trade it. All right. And I probably will never sell it. My kids will probably inherit it because I have other assets to live off of. And that's my wealth preservation vehicle. Silver is money because you could take a one ounce silver coin that's worth $100 or $200 and barter with it. It's money. All right. But what are you going to do? Take a $10,000 U.S. gold coin, a one ounce gold coin and cut it up? How do you make change? with? How do you make change with that? All right. Now, for me, you just got to shave the coin. That's all. Shavings. Well, that's what they used to do in the Roman era, right? <laughs> they used to, to do that. Like, I would love to have a lot more silver in my life, all right? Yeah. But if you want to put a lot of money into precious metals, you got money set aside, you want to put $100,000 into silver. How many ounces of silver do you have to buy to put $100,000 in it? We could do the math, but it's a lot, mm-hmm. right? And uh, 1,000 ounces of silver, how many pounds is that, right? And 1,000 ounces of silver is only $35,000. Yeah. All right. So you'd have to have 3,000 ounces of silver to have 100,000 in it. How many gold coins at 2,500 does it take to put $100,000 into it? 40 ounces. A little little less. Yes. Yes. Versus 3,000 ounces. All right. Mm -hmm. So you can't store silver if you want to put a lot of money in it. That's a problem for big investors in metals is that you just can't buy enough. You have to take your walk-in closet and make it a, a vault to do that. And what if you want to get out of Dodge? You want to get out of Dodge? Yeah. yeah at least you, you can take $100,000 worth of gold coins and throw it in my wife's pocketbook and jump in the car. You're not going to do that with that much silver. For the average person, go out. Nobody could tell me you can't go out today and buy five American Eagle silver coins for $150. If you can't, don't go out to dinner this week You can take that money and buy some silver. Everybody could do it. There's hardly anybody to, that's listening to me right now that can't go out and start protecting themselves against inflation by every month or every paycheck buying some coins. All right. That's the number one thing that I yeah. would advise people to do if yeah. you're afraid about inflation. Hopefully we have a lot of time before the real inflation hits, but it could be two months from now. Yeah. We never know when it happens because it happens very quickly. It's gradual that all at once it happens. Yeah. Uh, Historically, that's the way it's happened. Well, and and that's then what when, we've seen in other countries too, right? Like right, recently, absolutely. recent history, that's what we see happening, right? It's just, it's gradual. And then all of a sudden, boom, the, the, the levy breaks and then that's it. And a lot of it's psychological. Uh, the term inflation expectations are just as important as inflation itself. Okay. What people think is going to happen. So say you like coffee and you think coffee is going to be 35% more three months from now. What are you going to do? You're going to go out and buy as much coffee as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, see, that's a tough one for me, though, Lou, because I'm going to wind up drinking it. I'm going to be drinking my assets. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it's coming down to hyperinflation, we're going to be drinking something stronger than coffee. I'll tell you yeah. that. <laughs> no, <laughs> but think about what happens. We have just in time supply chains when they're working, by the way. But if everybody runs out there and tries to buy 15 cans of coffee because they think it's going to be more expensive a week from now, a month from now, you're going to have empty shelves. Right. What's that going to make people think it's going to make people scared, isn't it? You remember what it was like in COVID when you went into a store and there was empty shelves? Yeah. The people fighting over toilet paper of all things. I still don't understand the toilet paper thing. (laughs) I I just don't understand it. But anyway, that that never uh, made sense. No, it never did. That was the first thing that I was in Costco. I couldn't believe the, the craziness over toilet paper, but I'm a prepper. I have 150 rolls of toilet paper. I'm not going to fight. Oh, I thought you were going to say you had a bidet. (laughs) <laughs> no, I don't need that either. <laughs> I've been in Europe many times. I don't understand how those things work. I really still hey, don't. I just bought two like Japanese toilets for my house. So we're reno- we're doing some renovations. I'm, I'm getting that sucker put in. So we'll see. I don't even know what a Japanese toilet is. but It, um, it does all that. So anyway, hopefully. So the inflation expectations, when you see the shelves are empty, you're going to say, oh, my God, I better buy sugar. 
right? So now people are just trying to buy anything. And when they see that their currency is losing value, you want to get rid of the currency and buy something of value, whether it's food, whether it's gold, whether it's, it's anything of value, housing, a house. I'd rather have my money as equity in a house during inflation than money in a savings account earning 2%. Mm-hmm. In a 20% or 30% inflation world per month. Yeah. <laughs> That's the definition of hyperinflation is, is, is 50% inflation a month. But if you look at the Weimar Republic in Germany, inflation was doubling every six hours. Mm-hmm. All right. Wow. They, were pay- they were paying workers twice a day. And as soon as they paid the workers, their spouse, their wife was outside. They give them the money and they run out and go buy food or something. And then they get paid later in the day and go out and spend it. That's how fast prices were going up. So if you think 9% inflation that we had in 2022 was bad inflation, that's nothing. That's really nothing. When you talk about hyperinflation, it's a scary thing. All right. It's not uh, just an inconvenience. It's something that I hope I don't see in my lifetime. But unfortunately, I believe I will. Yeah. Wow. Well, oh, you I hope, hope we don't see. I mean, sure. I love your insights and like your passion for just sometimes people need to feel the fear to be able to make the change. Yeah. And uh, as we get into the final round here, so looking back now, what is one of the biggest mistakes that you've made when it's come to your finances or your business life? Like something you wish you would have done sooner or something in general? Yeah, there's one. Okay. And it comes down to the same idea about inflation. I should have bought an office building. Uh, when shortly after I started my firm, because I've been paying three thousand thirty five hundred dollars rent for thirty seven years, oh. uh, uh, I could have bought a building, built a building, had tenants in it, included my own office, and would have had a multi million dollar paid off office right now, which was my mistake. I've also made bad investments. As an investment guy, a certified financial planner, you'd think I wouldn't, but I like to speculate when I was younger. Yeah. Uh, and I made the cardinal rule. I broke the cardinal rule by putting all my eggs in one basket at one point, mm. thinking that it was going to it was going to get me rich when I was young and had to start all over again financially. So I've made mistakes, mainly when I was young. I'm much more wiser at 64 than I was <laughs> back then. But yeah, I made mistakes. We all make mistakes. The key is, I always say, it's not being wrong that's bad. It's staying wrong. Yeah. It's and it's not learning from your mistakes. And I learned a valuable lesson when I lost a lot of money in one security that I should not have been overly exposed to. I'll never do it again. All right. I learned the rule that nothing's guaranteed, no matter how good things sound, something can go wrong. And you, you can't go all in on anything in your life, financially or otherwise. I guess yeah. we go all in with our spouse. <laughs> we can't, <laughs> we can't yeah. avoid that. But going all in in investments is the cardinal rule. You, you certainly don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, I love that. 100%. 100%. So actually, speaking of lessons learned, that's a great segue into the next question of the final round. Lou, what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started out? And I know like you have a, a long history and long career of doing this before you even got started in this side of things, probably while you were still in school, whatever it may have been, something that, you, that you've learned that you wish you knew at the very beginning. I wish I knew the basics of finance, what a security was. I went to college. I went to pre-med. I wanted to be a dentist of all things. Okay. I had a little bit too much fun in college and my grades were not where they needed to be to go to dental school in New Jersey, in America. I had to go overseas. So I shift gears. I graduated with a microbiology degree and I didn't want to be doing blood tests in a lab somewhere. And I saw an ad in the paper for financial sales. I didn't even know what a stock was or mutual funds. It was a mutual fund company. I was 23 years old. I went to the interview in New York City. I went to there an hour early. I went to the bookstore and read it, read everything about mutual funds and sounded like a mutual fund expert when I walked into the company and they hired me right away. But I wish I didn't have to have on-the-job training about what finance was, what the way to live your life properly and everything else. Did have on-the-job training and I learned quite quickly. I almost left the business three times early in it because I had a little, I had a family and it's commission based and it wasn't easy. It seems that every time I needed a decent sale, God came through and kept me in the business. And here I am 41 years later and I had a very successful career, but I don't have very many regrets. Uh, I really don't. Uh, I just wish I would have started early learning about finance. And that's been my pet peeve 
for many, many years is we teach our kids all kinds of mush in school, but we don't teach them how to balance a checkbook, how basic income taxes work, what, what a credit card is. It's silly. And I volunteered sure. in my school district. I, I will teach for free personal finance classes in high school. And I think it should be mandated. Now, the good thing is more and more people, more and more school districts now are adopting personal finance classes. And I think that's a good thing. And hopefully it will be required in all high schools across the nation. I'm glad yeah. you said that because I was actually going to bring that up and say, I'm starting to see a lot more schools doing that. And that is phenomenal. Fantastic. So I homeschool my kids, right? Oh, so they have learned personal finances. I make them read personal finance books as well. And, and now this year, my oldest is going into high school and we're actually going to have her go to school. So I feel like she's going to be ahead of the game when it comes to that, when she gets there. But yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up. And later on, after we're done, give me your contact information. I'll send you some books, financial physician books. I wrote this book specifically for young adults. It is not financial ease. It's the basics of finance, soup to nuts, have financial responsibility and all that kind of stuff. Great. I, I'm, it's perfect for somebody just getting married, a young couple, so they don't get into sure, trouble. Sure. They don't go down the right thing. So uh, I'll get you some books if you want them. Sweet. Yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to read it. And yeah, that's one of the things I get from parents and things too asking how they can teach kids. Cause that was the number one thing that I hear in my coaching is like, well, I wasn't taught this. And then they use that as like a way to keep, they keep themselves stuck or they're like too overwhelmed to start. And they feel this guilt and shame around money. And it's just like this cycle that people get in. But I did see a stat that said over 50% of schools, I think by next year, will have some sort of personal finance education. Who knows exactly what they're teaching, but like something that's mandatory in schools. So that I think it is, you shouldn't be able to graduate without passing a personal finance course in high school. And, and it probably sh it should be four years. It really should be. But it's, oh, going yeah. in the right, it's going in the right direction, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Next question. Do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that's just getting started in finance with investing or whatever? Okay. This is what I would do. If you just want to get started, first thing you do, you have to have an emergency fund. We can't even talk about investing or anything. So- Put some money away in a liquid savings account. I don't care where it is. I don't care what the interest rate is. Just enough money that if you need new tires, you're not whipping out that credit card. Okay. So what do you say? Like 5,000, is there an amount you want people to try to get to? It's very personal. It's very personal. Everybody's yeah. different. And it depends on what your, your financial situation is. Now, it depends how young you are too. But and it depends how stable your job is. Do you feel that you could possibly be out of work? You better have six months living expenses minimally. If you have a secure job, you work for a union, you're not worried about that. Maybe you need less, all right? But the fact is every American should have, in my opinion, a minimum of three months and preferably six months living expenses put away. That way, when life happens, you don't have to go into debt to, to deal with it. And how many Americans, there's surveys out there, what, 50, 60, I don't even know what the, the current number is. That they could have come up with $400 for an emergency expenditure without selling something or going into debt with their credit card. So that's a sad state to be in. So the number one goal in getting started, save money, put it aside, don't touch it, don't invest it, don't do anything with it. That's for emergencies. Then once you have that, open up a no-load mutual fund at Vanguard or Fidelity. And put a fixed number, a fixed dollar amount each paycheck into an S and P 500 fund. I don't care what the market's doing. Right now, if you have a lot of money in S and P 500 fund, I'd say get it out because I think we're heading into a very bad market. But if you're dollar cost averaging and put money in a regular basis with small amounts, just do it every paycheck forever. All right. I don't care if it's a hundred dollars a paycheck, fifty dollars a paycheck. That's the great thing about Vanguard and Fidelity. You don't need a lot of money to put yeah. into these things regularly, right? When you build up a certain amount, a, a, a critical mass, and maybe you're in your late 20s, early 30s, have a meeting with a certified financial planner and get a long-term plan. Live within your means, number one. Avoid debt like the plague, except for debt on your home. If you pay off your car, don't get a new car. Keep it for as long as you can. I hold cars 12 years. Some people are car people. I'm not. Just get me from point A to point B. I don't the car isn't my ego. I'm pretty well off. I don't drive a Mercedes or a Lexus. I drive a Camry. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'd rather spend my money uh, going to Europe or buying gold coins. Yeah. I'm not going to spend yeah. my money on, on new cars that are depreciating. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. All right, Lou. So the final question of the final round is, 
Uh, and I will preface this with besides your own, because I know you have an awesome book as well and a, an awesome podcast, and we'll get to that. But do you have a favorite business, investing, or real estate related book or podcast or both? Wow, that's a good question. There's certain people that I follow. I, I'm stumped on that. I, I can't just come up with one right now because there's, there's, there's so many. But uh, is, is, there, is there one that you like to listen to in the morning, maybe? You know what? It's, it's not really a podcast or a book. Okay. It is, it is the Wall Street Journal. It is Yahoo Finance. I know you're on a cover of the magazine. I saw that. There's so many, there's so much on the internet from YouTube videos. You'll stumble across your podcast. You'll stumble across mine. There's just different degrees of how far along you are on the loan. Are you looking for investing for beginners? Go on YouTube. Say investing for beginners. You'll have curriculum upon curriculum there that you're going to be able to teach, learn from. Right. And if you're looking to uh, enter, I'm entering retirement now. What do I do? Income streams and things like that. There's so much references available to you. But listening to good podcasts like yours, like mine, on a regular basis will keep you informed. A, teach you the right things to do and the wrong, not the wrong things to do. And learn a lot about stuff that you don't know about yet. And the well informed investor, saver, whatever you want to call that person, is going to be way ahead of everybody else who rather not listen to anything about finance, the economy, markets, and things like that. So don't be ignorant. Educate yourself every day. Yeah, there's so much free. That's how I got started was just like, okay, I'm just going to start reading books, when whatever it was. So yeah, that's great advice. And I know it's hard to pick just one. There's so many good ones. <laughs> I feel the same. There's so many good yeah, I, uh, I, yeah. As we come to a close, where can people find more information about you? Like where, what website, social media, where can people find and follow you and your book and get your book? And listen to uh, your podcast. All right. First off, I'm everything the financial physician. That's my brand. The Financial Physician. You Google it on the financialphysician.com. That's my website that has all links to my podcast and blog and everything else there. I have a Rumble channel. I've been banned from YouTube for life for certain things I've said about certain illnesses uh, and certain elections. I am banned for life. And they didn't even tell me why. That's censorship in America, which is a whole other subject. But I do have a Rumble channel. The Financial Position Rumble channel. All my videos are there. My book is available free of charge. It's an electronic book at my website. All you got to do is give us your email and we'll give you the link to the book. If anybody prefers a hard copy of the book, email me at lou at the financial and I'll send you a signed hard copy. Awesome. Awesome. Free Thank of charge. So free of that. charge. I'll, pa I'll pay for the shipping. Look at the seed Even that, my favorite price. <laughs> Look, I have. I bought a lot of books when it was published in 2010 because you give a client a book instead of a business card it makes a little bit different cred, yeah. but I bought them to give them away. I'm not selling these books. I mean, you, you can get my book on Amazon for, I think, $5.99. It almost embarrasses me that my book is being sold for $5.99, <laughs> uh, but I gave them away until they run out. Uh, I rather than be in somebody, a young couple's hand that's sitting in a uh, collecting dust in a warehouse. So I give them away. But the electronic book is beautiful. It's a great PDF. It's easy to read. And again, it's not financial ease. It's made for the average person to read. Many people read it cover to cover in one sitting. And we cover the basics of money. And yeah. that's it. Listen to the podcast each week. I upload a new podcast every Sunday morning, 7 a.m. And it's available for a year. So we have all the back, bad back podcasts. But just go to the financialphysician.com. Everything's there. And we, it's funny. We also release our episodes on Sundays as well. So good choice there. So <laughs> Lou, this has been fantastic. Like, honestly, you are definitely a wealth of knowledge. You have many years of experience doing this. I can see personally, just from your background and what you just said about your book, right? How you, you feel like it might be a little bit embarrassing that you're selling it for five ninety nine, but at the same time, and you give away a free PDF of it. You, you are legitimately a genuine person that's trying to help people, Right. And the perfect kind of person that I'd love to have on this show, right? Because you are giving, right? You are trying to help people. You are trying to impart financial literacy out there in the community to help other people grow and, and live a better life and not get stuck at an end of life trying to figure out what they're going to do with themselves. So I just want to say like, we definitely genuinely appreciate what you provided for us today and what you provide for people every day. 
appreciate that. This career has given a lot to me and I believe in giving back and I'll do anything I can to help anybody. And if you have a personal finance issue that you want help with, email me at lewitthefinancialphysician.com. I will give you advice. I will not bill you. I'll send you in the right direction. And certainly we're always taking on clients anywhere in the country. Awesome. Hey, Hey. we're going to have all your links in the show notes and your email address for folks to get in touch with you to make it easy for people to find. But for those of you that are listening right now, the deal, if you're driving right now, please don't try to get those links. Wait till you're in a safe place. But again, Lou, thank you so much. I also want to say thank you to every single one of our listeners that are tuning in right now for joining me and Tanya and our special guest, Lou Scatinia, on the Average Joe Finances podcast. Yeah, make sure you go leave us a five-star review. Let us know what you liked about this episode, what you got from Lou, and what you're going to put into practice today. Awesome. So aloha from Hawaii. And Lake Tahoe. Have a great- and New Jersey. <laughs> and New Jersey. <laughs> and have New a Jersey. great rest of your day. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. 